Jamie Lewis, and welcome back to the Bassist.net. Today, I'm going to tackle a topic that comes up a lot with musicians, not just bass players, but all of us, who are trying to learn to adapt to a new style of playing live music. I'm talking about using in-ear monitors. It's something that's become quite popular over the past 10 years or so. I mean, the, the technology has been in use for, for decades, but now it's becoming uh, you know, much more affordable and the devices and everything is getting smaller. Um, so it, again, a lot of people are hopping on this bandwagon. So if you don't know what in-ears are, uh, they're headphones, but it's, we wear them on the inside of our ears. And they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes from the just the cruddy white iPod headphones that came with your phone uh, to you know something like by Sennheiser or Shure that you could get at Guitar Center, all the way up to like custom molded, potentially pricey, um, you know, custom ear, uh, in-ear monitors. Those are the ones that I recommend. And here's the reason why it's not because they cost more money. It must be better. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the drivers could be great, but that's not the thing. It's the fact that they are custom molded to your ears. I have a set right here. These are the ones that I use. These are some dual driver West tones that I've been using for about 10 years now. Um, and they're great. They work, they do the job. Uh, I have to get new ones soon because my, they don't fit my ears anymore because your ears and your nose continue to grow your whole life. Bummer, I know. So uh, so they don't fit so well. So I, I need to kind of reinvest and get new ones. But as you can see, they are shaped to my ear canal, ear drum. I actually don't know. I'm not a doctor. But they will only fit me. And here's the reason why that's so good. It's a very snug fit. Meaning it's kind of like as if you shoved your fingers all the way in your ears and you just get that really, in fact, it's uncomfortable to wear and talk. I'm not going to do that anymore. I only ever wear these if I'm listening to music or if I'm playing it. Um, so again, they're molded to my ears and it blocks all the sound from coming in. That is great because uh, that gives you clarity. That gives you, make sure that whatever I'm listening to in here, I'm hearing it. I'm not hearing the drum cymbals crashing away when I've got the drum cymbals pulled down in my mix. Uh, and so then that also is hearing protection, which is great as musicians, we need to protect our hearing. Um, and again, because they're molded, it's a snug fit. It keeps sound from coming out, which means I can run my volume quieter, which means I have the most clear crystal clear sound you've ever heard in your life. But here's the thing, if I'm blocking out sound from coming in and I'm only really paying attention to what's being piped in, I gotta know how to do a mix. I gotta know how to play with these things because I'm not hearing the amps on stage. There aren't any, I'm not hearing the drummer, I'm not hearing the wedges. They're not there, you've probably noticed at church or a lot of venues um, that there's no wedges anymore, there's no amps on stage. Well, again, with these in-ear monitors, with the technology that comes along, uh, is sort of the drawback of, well, we have a, have to have a quieter stage volume, which is a drag for you, the musician, but it's awesome for front of house because now he can mix it sound exactly the way it needs to. He doesn't have to go, um, I'm, I've got the guitar all the way off, but I still hear too much guitar. What am I supposed to do? That's a drag for your front of house. Um, so now you put him in control and he can make, or she can make everything sound awesome because the stage is quiet. So that means you have to have really, really good monitoring in order to play, because especially you as the bass player, what's your job? You're supposed to glue the whole ensemble together. Well, how are you supposed to glue together what you can't hear? Aha, which is why, again, custom molds are the way to go because it guarantees that you're gonna hear what you put in. Now, whether or not you are good at making your mix, that's up to you. <laughs> I'm gonna help you with that today, right? But at least that sets you up for success. I can hear everything that I need to, and I can block out the things that are gonna damage my hearing or that I don't want to hear, uh, like room noise and, and you know all those types of things. And front of house can make it sound great. And also just the benefit of having them in, no matter what part of stage I walk to, I'm gonna have the same mix. In other words, if I stand next to my amp and I play, Obviously, I can hear myself, right? I go over to the guitar player. He's on the other side of the stage. Well, I hear myself less. Duh, because my amp's 10 feet away now. I, I'm hearing it differently. But when you wear in-ears, it doesn't matter where I am on stage. I can walk this way. I can walk that way. My ears go with me each time, <laughs> right? So there are so many benefits to using in-ears, but there's also a lot of drawbacks. As long as you know what you're doing and as long as you know how to mix, you're going to be just fine. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. Now, before I get too far into it, when I say I'm going to show you how to mix, I mean, we're not going to get into anything heavy. You don't need to know how to EQ or compress or parallel process or any uh, intricate mixing techniques. I'm talking about volume and I'm talking about panning. And if you don't, don't even know what those are, that's okay. I'm going to show you. So I'm going to do all this today in a recording software called Ableton Live. In fact, I got my laptop right here. This is what we're going to uh, 
uh, how I'm going to show you how to mix your in-ears. You might be using uh, like an Avion box or a hearback system or something by Furman or by Behringer. You might have an iPad app or something on your phone. It, that part will change from venue to venue, church to church. I mean, wherever it is that you're working. But the things I'm going to show you with volume and panning, I mean, that is going to stay the same across the board. You don't have to worry uh, about that part changing. Okay, so you don't have to be a great mixing engineer. You just need to know the bare bones, just a little bit about how to get a good mix. Because again, this is all about creating clarity and making sure that you can hear what your players are doing. It might not be as important as a listener, but as a player, I got to know what's happening in order to play to it. <laughs> Otherwise, if I'm playing to a misrepresentation, what do you think the odds are that I'm going to start playing the wrong thing, right? It's actually pretty good. So um, let me show you exactly how to do that, okay, in this recording software. So check this out. So like I said, this is Ableton Live. It's a recording software, and it does exactly the same thing that, you know, your Avion or your Behringer board or your iPad app, whatever the thing is, you know, here's your volume faders, right? Here's your panning knobs. It's all the same stuff. Um, it's just laid out like this. I've got a click track. I've got a drummer, a bass player, keys, three guitar players, a lead vocalist, and some backing vocals. That might change. You might only have one singer, uh, two guitar players, no keyboard player. You might not play to a click. Instead of one that says drums, you might have kick and then snare and then tom, one, two, three, and overhead left and overhead right. That just means you got more work to do your drum mix. I've only got just one drums louder, drums quieter. Um, I made it easy on myself. Th this song that we're going to listen to, by the way, comes from an album that I released about five years ago called When Will Then Be Now. And uh, actually, th there's a link popping up. <laughs> you can click on that to pre-order the uh, uh, five-year anniversary vinyl pressing that I'm putting out this summer because this album turns five. So if you like what you hear, please go and, and, and uh, check that out. I really, really appreciate that. A couple of things I'm going to say right off the bat. Number one, you can see I've pulled the faders all the way down. I like to start from a clean mix each time. And the reason is this. Things change. Instruments change. Uh, gain settings change. Players change. Everything changes from day to day, hour to hour. And so you're not going to have the same mix you had last time just by pulling up a preset. So I start from score one. I grabbed all my faders and I dragged them all down so that I'm starting from scratch each time. Now, if you're in a touring band and it's the same guys each week, or it's the same guys every night, same settings, same guitars, I mean, you're like, okay, uh, you, you probably only have to do this like two or three times and then your mix will stay the same every time. And that's, again, the beauty of this is it's digital. It's recallable. I can just press the save button. But if you're playing at church or at a bar or something like that, uh, it's just the environment, the players, everything's going to be so different each time that it really just, it makes sense to start from scratch. So pull all your faders down. Put all of your panning knobs to the center. And I'll explain about that, you know, in a, in a little bit. One other thing I want you to do is over here. You've got a channel that says master, or you've got a master bus fader, or some sort of master volume for your channel. Go ahead and pull this down about, I don't know, five or six dB or so, I know, seven, let's go, let's go with six, six something. The number doesn't really matter. What's important is that we're giving ourselves headroom so that we don't get into distortion or clipping. I'll explain <laughs> what all that is a little bit later, but for now, just go ahead and do that, and in a couple of minutes, we'll come back to this. All I'm gonna do is I'm just going to introduce these instruments one at a time. I'm gonna start with a click, I'm gonna get it where I want it, and then I'm gonna move on to the drummer, and then I'm gonna move on to the bass player, and, and one at a time, I'm just gonna pull these instruments in. That way I'm not dealing with too many variables. I don't have to worry about uh, you know things going wrong or just trying to juggle too much at once. Um, I'll introduce them a single instrument at a time. So again, my band, we're playing to a click, so I'm gonna bring the click in. Now, again, uh, if you're not playing to a click, you would start with the drums. But pretty much, I don't want to lose this. This is my timekeeper. This is the person telling me, uh, you know, everything that I need to know about <laughs> where the downbeat is and if I'm pushing, if I'm dragging. So I want to make sure I don't lose this. So I'm setting it pretty high. And this, I'm going to balance all of these other instruments against this click. This click is my reference point. Again, if you're not using a click, it's your drummer. But I'm just, I want to make sure I don't lose anything over here, and I don't want to get louder than it. Everything's probably going to be quieter than it, except for maybe my instrument. Uh, we'll have to see how things turn out in the mix. So now that I got my click where I want it. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to start adding some drums. Mm 
Now you want to be careful uh, with the drums because the cymbals have a lot of frequencies in them. Listen to that ride cymbal. That ride cymbal is taking up a lot of real estate. <laughs> so I don't want to uh, have too much of that. It's going to it's going to ruin things for my cymbals and my sing uh, for my keyboards and my singers and maybe even my guitars. Um, if I had individual control over the overheads, I would just pull them down and leave the kick and snare where I want them. I don't have that option because I just have a drum fader. That's all the mixing engineer gave me. So I'm just going to work with them as a whole. I think that's a pretty good balance. I don't have, uh, I can still hear the kick in the snare and I don't have too much cymbals, so I'm gonna go with that. So let's come on over here, we'll add in bass next. Now, this is probably higher than it should be. Oh, well, I'm a bass player. <laughs> and this is the instrument that I'm going to be playing. So I want to make sure I can hear it. Again, we're not trying to mix a record. We're not trying to, uh, <clears throat> you know, balance everything so that it sounds good. I'm trying to balance everything so that I can hear it. There's a difference between those two things. They might be the same sometimes. But in this case, I need the bass hotter than the drums because I need to know I need to know if I'm making a mistake or not. So now that I got the bass where I want it, I'm going to move on to the keys. Sounds like we got an organ and a piano on this one. Again, you might have control individually, but I've got them both on the same, apparently. Um, now, I, I do it in this order on purpose. I start with click, I go to drums, I go to bass. Those are the foundational instruments. Now I'm going to go to the softer sounding ones, your keyboards, your acoustic guitars, the ones that will more than likely get lost in the mix <laughs> if you're not careful. So I go to them next, make sure I've got them where I want them. Yeah, and that sounds pretty good. I can hear the piano, I can hear everything, and uh, not losing the click, not losing anything else. So we're getting off to a good start. Now, I'm gonna move to the guitars next, and there's something interesting. I have two rhythm guitar players. I'm gonna solo them up. Here's what the first one's doing. Here's what the next one's doing. So they're both rhythm comping uh, chord parts, right? Check out what happens when I put them both together. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, here's the thing. In the mix, I'm probably going to lose these guys. Let's check out what happens. Watch, listen to this. I kind of stopped hearing them individually. <laughs> I started to hear just them as one guitar. I didn't really hear the separation of one that was going da chica da chica da chica chica da, and then the one that was just drumming the big nasty chords, right? Um, and, and that's obvious because the more things we add uh, to our mix, the more cluttered it gets, and we need to make room for that, and that's called panning. So panning is where you place things specifically in the mix. And I know it gets kind of confusing because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to move it to this side or that side. And you're going to think, well, that's kind of weird. I only hear the guitar out of this side. And so it kind of makes the thing sound heavy over there. Well, you're going to pan something else on the other side to kind of balance it out. Here's the reason why you want to do that. And this is probably the most important part. If you get nothing else from this video, take this home, okay? You need to pan when you use in-ears. And here's the reason why. Imagine you're taking a picture. A family portrait, you got a family of six, right? Uh, and so I'm gonna take a, a group photo of you. So I'm gonna line you up single file, right? Put the smallest person in front and then uh, the tallest person back and everyone all the way up. That's a terrible way to take a picture, right? Because you're only gonna see all of the first person. You'll see the first person head to toe, but the next person only chin and up. And the next person nose and up. The last person probably just their forehead or just their hair sticking up, right? Like that's not a good way to take a photo. If I want clarity, if I want a good image, how would I do it? spread you out because here's another thing yeah put them all single file well you've got all this awkward dead space on this side and on this side like what's going on over there compositionally that's just a weird photo 
right? It puts all the attention right here, but I can't even see everything that I'm trying to pay attention to. So if I spread you all out across the image, right? Now my photo looks composed very well, right? It's, it's balanced. I got tall people here and here and everything looks great, but I can see all of you from toe to head or, or just whatever, you know, like whatever I want you to see, you can, you can see them all. That's what we're going for with panning. When I put all of the instruments dead center, I have the opposite effect of clarity. Everyone's just competing with each other, trying to get over and trying to like, no keyboard player, no drums. Like you can't hear everything. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave the kick, the snare, the bass, and the lead vocalist dead center. Those are the ones that, because those are your foundational instruments and your lead instrument, right? You want them to be dead center. I don't really want to hear the kick drum on this side or on that, or the bass over here on that side. That kind of uh, will throw off your equilibrium more, more than likely. So kick, snare, bass, lead vocal, leave them dead center. Everyone else, I'm going to start spreading them out across the spectrum to allow it to sound, just to give clarity, allow it to sound balanced. And again, as a player playing to these people, I can tell what this guitar player is doing because he's only he sticks out like a sore thumb. Or when someone sings a, word, a wrong word, I'm like, oh, it was that one. That's the person who sang the wrong part. Or it was me because I only heard it over there. You, you, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's creating clarity and we need that when we're playing with in-ears. So check out what I'm going to do now. I'm going to start panning these guitars around and watch what happens this time. Again, we just have much more clarity. I can really hear this guitar player on the left and this guitar player on the right. And so I just, I can really tell who's who now. And watch what happens when I put them back in the mix. In fact, this guitar player over here that's on the left is playing the chicka jacka chicka bow. I can actually pull his volume back a little bit because now he's sticking out like a sore thumb because he's so far over on the left. No longer do I hear them as just like one guitar instrument. I have separation, I have clarity, and I can even pull their volumes back a little bit because they're panned. They stick out like a sore thumb. I don't got to worry about it. Let's go over here and take a listen to uh, the lead guitar. This guy's playing a solo. And what I like to do with solo instruments or lead instruments, I like to pan them same thing, you know, a little bit off center. That way, again, we have this fact that they stick out a little bit. Here, check this out. So again, I don't have to have the volume as high. He's not taking up as much room because he's over here on the right a little bit more than he is on the left. Um, and so again, for soloists, for lead instruments, I like to know what they're doing, when they're doing it, <laughs> you know, so I can stay out of their way. Um, and so that's a good way to do that is to put them all the way over. So now let's move over to the uh, to the lead vocalist over here. And again, I'm not going to pan this guy. Or if I do, it's going to be very slight because maybe I have like two vocalists and I want to do like this kind of thing but I just have lead vocal and backing vocal. So in this case, I'm gonna leave the vocalist dead center. Check out what it sounds like. Now, I've probably got this quieter than it should be, and I'm not a singer, so I don't really want to hear much singers, <laughs> and here's the reason why. Because their vocal mic picks up a lot of cymbals, a lot of room, a lot of audience, um, a lot of stage, and you might not want that. That's uh, Most of that is noise that you don't want to have extra of. Um, so I tend to run them a bit quieter than I should. Um, if you're a lead singer, then you just kind of have to deal with that, with hearing a lot of that muddiness in your mix. Uh, but since I'm not the one singing, I can kind of pull you back a little bit and um, not sacrifice my mix <laughs> just to be able to hear you. I'll go ahead and I'll add in the backing vocals now. Now here's
here's something I might want to do. Check this out. I've got this guy panned to the right, this guy panned to the left, this guy panned to the right. Right now I've got two things on the right and only one on the left. Maybe I want to come over here with this guy a little bit, or maybe I'll do it with the keyboards and I'll put this one over here. You see, I'm just, I'm trying to balance things. This is hard right, this is hard left. A little bit on the left, so a little bit on the right. Again, think of it like composing uh, um, a, a picture, right? I just want things to look balanced so that I have clarity um, and I can actually <laughs> hear what it is that I want to. Things just sounded pretty good for me. Uh, if this bass was muted and it was me playing along, I feel like I could uh, lock in to the groove and, and follow the song and, and I wouldn't be having any issues. Before I move on, I wanna point this out. Look over here. Remember when I said I want you to pad the master fader? Here's the reason why. Um, quite often, people mix too high. In other words, like, oh, I can't hear the drums, so they add more drums. Oh, I can't hear the bass, so I add more bass. All right, we keep pushing these faders up and up and up. So let's say this was a normal mix, right? A normal person's mix, and they've got these guys all the way up here like this, right? Um, what happens if this guy is at zero, we're gonna get into distortion and clipping. Okay, so check this out. I'm gonna bring everything back in. I'm actually gonna pull the volume down because I don't wanna blow your ears out, <laughs> but you're gonna see this something interesting happened over here on this meter. So keep your eye over here as I bring this back to zero. Watch what happens. The fader isn't green anymore. It's red for the most part. Uh, and that's because everything's too hot. It's it's running into overdrive and it's distorting. Now, if you're a guitar player cranking your amp up, yeah, distortion is great. If you're trying to get a clear, clean mix, distortion is terrible. It's adding, <laughs> it's adding just nasty clipping into your sound, right? So again, for most people, they're mixing too hot. They're pushing their faders up too high and they're getting into distortion land. So how do we fix that? Watch. You can see the meters now are green, <laughs> right? I pulled my master bus down um, and I'm not getting into overdrive land. So uh, if you give yourself a little bit of a pad, it's gonna make sure that you don't clip. It's, you're not gonna get into distortion. And that's really good when we're going for clarity and when we're trying to get a clean representation of what I'm supposed to be playing to. All right, so like I told you, piece of cake, right? All this was actually really, really easy. You didn't have to go to recording school. You didn't have to learn how to produce or how to use Pro Tools or any of that complicated stuff. It's simple. Balance your volumes, pan it out from left to right across the sonic spectrum, and you're good. You'll have clarity, you'll have separation. That's gonna make you play better. So just kind of wrap it all up. If you take one thing home, even if you knew all this mixing stuff already, if you just take one thing, remember, your mix is only as good as you can make it. You have to understand that you can only play as well as you can hear, which with in-ears depends on how well you can mix, which means you have to know how to do this. <laughs> so practice it, practice mixing. I'm actually, I'm gonna, um, there's a link popping up right now. You can download the exact stems that I use today uh, to play through. I'm gonna loop them over and over and over again. You can import them into GarageBand if you don't have anything. Uh, you can download a free trial of Ableton Live, I think for 30 days. Um, just go to their website. I think it's ableton.com or something like that. I don't know. I'll put another link. It's popping up right now. <laughs> go problem solved. Uh, so you can load those in your DAW and you can practice doing exactly what I just did. Remember, just go slow. Take it one instrument at a time. One click, one drum, one this, one that, right? Just at the slower you go, the less variables you're dealing with and adjust as you go. And um, again, the more you practice it, the better you'll get. So download those stems. Try this out at church on Sunday morning. Uh, try it out at your bar gig this Friday night or a band rehearsal or whatever it is. Um, just try to get clarity. Set your volumes, pan them out, and I guarantee you're gonna like the results. So thank you so much for stopping by thebasis.net and I'll see you next time, okay? Hey, if you like what I do, please click on the subscribe button right here. And if you really like what I do, then click over here to see how affordable it is to join me at thebasis.net. But if you just want the free stuff, then click here to check out whatever YouTube's sophisticated robots think you should watch next. I'm sure they know what's best for you.